Like you can say whatever you want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just as you have individual personal laments, so you have national laments. Now, on what kind of occasion would a national lament be called? Just think of the book of Joel. Joel, right, there was a grasshopper plague. And what was the response of uh, people to that? National. The priest called a national day of fasting and prayer and lamentation. And you get, within the book of Joel, you get the summary of the lament. Spare your people, O God. Uh, why should the nation say, where is your God? So there is a lament there. Um, other occasions might be a drought. Or most commonly, when uh, you get an attack by an enemy or invasion by an enemy or defeat by an enemy. National laments. Let's have a look at a national lament. It has all the features of uh, uh, an individual lament. Psalm 79. We're back to you, I think, Tony, aren't we? 79. What? Has, have you read, read Stephen? You have. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Psalm 79. Psalm 79, and work out what the occasion is for this lament as it's read. Off you go, Tony. Right, okay. Yes, 79. Oh God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have reduced Jerusalem to rubble. They have given the dead bodies of your servants as food to the birds of the air, the flesh of your saints to the beasts of the earth. They have poured out blood like water all around Jerusalem. And there is no one to bury the dead. We are objects of reproach to our neighbours, of scorn and derision to those around us. How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Oh, how long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? How long will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you and the kingdoms, that, that do not call on your name, for they have devoured Jacob and destroyed his homeland. Do not hold against us the sins of the fathers. May your mercy come quickly to meet us, for we are in desperate need. Help us, O God, our Saviour, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, Where is their God? Before our eyes, make known among the nations that you avenge the outpoured blood of your servants. May the groans of the prisoners come before you. By the strength of your arm, preserve those condemned to die. Pay back into the laps of our neighbours seven times the reproach they have hurled at you, O Lord. Then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will praise you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. Yes, Scott? Question. With, um, with I'm fine, I'll come back to it. Okay. Um, what's the situation here? What's happened? They've been invaded by an enemy. And it looks as if they are, you know, the enemy is going to uh, destroy them as a nation. Now, notice that the attack on them is also an attack on God. And so they ask God for God's help here to deliver them and to give them justice. Okay. Now, uh, notice it ends with a promise of praise, then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture will praise you forever. From generation to generation we will recount your praise. Notice the vow of praise at the end. Okay, the other end of it, let's say now the um, God hears their prayers. They've got a king, uh, their king, their armies have defeated the enemy. What would happen after that? Well, the king and the army would come to the temple in Jerusalem and the choir, the musicians, would lead them in procession into the temple, a victory procession, and there in front of them, they would come into God's presence and what would they do? Praise. They would thank and praise God for their deliverance. We get a psalm of national thanksgiving, a very famous one, in Psalm 118. Um, uh, we'll go through it fairly quickly. It's a wonderful, very important psalm. Uh, Josh, can you start reading it? I'll, I'll tell you to stop at a particular point. So imagine here, okay, there's been a victory. 
the king comes at the head of the army, and the I who's speaking here is the king. So the I is the royal I, the king. Uh, start off. Can you read, please? I give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. With the Lord on my side, I do not fear. What can mortals do to me? The Lord is on my side to help me. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in mortals. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They blazed like a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was fallen, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and count the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. I'll stop there. Okay. Now, here the king, representing the whole nation, describes what happened. Um, uh, they were surrounded by their enemies. They called on the Lord. And what did the Lord do? destroyed their enemies and now they are celebrating the victory not that they've won but the victory that the Lord has won for them the victory over their enemies and uh, read the, the next verse please Stephen just one verse open for me the gates of righteousness I will enter and give thanks to the Lord right over the gates of righteousness if you can imagine the Solomon's temple there were two courts there was the inner court and there was the outer court this gateway that gateway okay? 15 steps going here up to the altar then the uh, temple itself uh, the gates of righteousness remember I explained this to you when we we're dealing with I, uh, Jeremiah's temple sermon are these gates here open to me the gates of righteousness who alone is allowed to go through this gate? People who are righteous. Righteous. People who are, whose sins have been forgiven, who are cleansed. Um, only the righteous can enter here. So unclean people can come into this space, but they need to be cleansed before they can come here up to the altar. So this is the location. The procession has come in here. And now the king at the head of the army, surrounded by the, the, his choir, singing this psalm, uh, says, open to me these gates. And you get a dialogue now between the king and the priests, who are the gatekeepers. Okay, Stephen, can you read this? And notice that you get this exchange. Uh, the king speaking, then you get the priest speaking. The king speaking, the priest pe uh, speaking. Read the rest of this. Verse Read from verse 19, just to repeat this. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. And then the priest. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous may enter. The king. I will give you thanks for you answered. You have become my salvation. The priest. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and that is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and delight in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festival procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Right, so this is a psalm of national thanksgiving. 
Um, it's also a royal psalm because a king is leading here in thanksgiving um, uh, on behalf of the nation. They come in to give thanks to the Lord. And they are, uh, notice verse um, uh, 27, with bows in their hand, hand, join in festal procession round the horns of the altar. The altar has four horns. Then the procession comes and goes around the altar. The people in procession have not, don't have, the soldiers don't have swords in their hands, but they have palm branches in their hands, which is the, the mark of victory in the ancient world. Victorious people hold palm branches. And as they go around the altar, they touch the four horns of the altar with the palm branches. And then they go out again. Any questions on that? Okay, lastly now, we get national um, hymns of praise. Now, they were sung um, uh, in the divine service as part of the regular liturgy. You may remember from the book of, uh, uh, from the Pentateuch, that every morning, every evening, a lamb and a cereal offering would be burnt on the altar here. Okay. Now, as the lamb was burnt on the altar, the two priests standing here and here sounded the trumpet, and the Levitical choir standing on their platform on top of these steps here would sing a psalm of praise in front of the altar. So as the smoke went up from the altar, the song of praise would begin. And they would sing praise about God addressed to the congregation. And they would invite the congregation in praising God. That psalm of praise announced that God was present here and announced that God was graciously present. It was a good God who was present here. Therefore, people could come and pray to him for help. Um, let's have a look at a psalm. And you can see the connection with that location in this psalm. And then we'll have a look at the origin of these psalms of praise. Uh, who's next is David. Psalm 100. As he reads it, can you find references to this location here in the uh, psalm? Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Okay, now what, do you get references here to this location? Where the praise is being sung? Where? Verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Later, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Notice it's plural. This gate and this gate. Enter his courts with praise. Which courts? This court and this court. So you have a procession here. People coming in, um, uh, entering and coming to God's presence with thanksgiving and praise. Now notice it's, it, this is part of the liturgy, the daily liturgy of the temple, uh, psalms of praise. Now, what's the origin of these psalms of praise? Uh, let's have a look at two passages which are very significant, which tell us how uh, this became a regular feature uh, at the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, uh, Garth, uh, can you read these two passages? First of all, First uh, Chronicles chapter 23 30 to 31. 1 Chronicles 23, 30 to 31. This is David making arrangements for the temple that his son Solomon would build. And what was it that David uh, instituted and established? Um, for the Levites, Levi should really get you to read this because this is the Levitical singers that are being spoken to here. <laughs> but Garth has the privilege of reading it. Uh, so, 31? Yes. They were also to stand every morning to thank and praise the Lord. 
they were to do the same in the evening. And whenever burnt offerings were presented to the Lord on Sabbath and at new moon festivals and at pointing feasts, on pointed feasts, they were to serve before the Lord regularly in the proper number and in the, pres- in the way prescribed for them. So, now, to f- fill you in the whole context, um, uh, there's two classes of uh, uh, people who worked at the temple. There were the priests and then there were the Levites. The Levites were the assistants of the priests. And a subgroup within the Levites was the uh, Levitical choir, the praise singers, the band. Um, and it was a very, very complicated arrangement. If you read Chronicles, you get all the details about uh, them. Uh, they were on a roster. There were three uh, uh, groups of praise singers, three families of praise singers. Um, but they were to offer or sing psalms of praise every morning and every evening as the burnt offering was being presented on the altar. Now, why did David establish this? Levi, can you go to Second Chronicles chapter 29, 25 to 30, which uh, gives us the origin of this uh, very important practice. By the way, we still continue it in church. We have songs of praise, we have musical instruments. This is where it comes from. Levi, 29, 25 to 30. Now this is uh, a story of what happened during the reign of Hezekiah um, when he restores the temple and its services uh, after uh, uh, the reign of his predecessor who had closed down the temple. He stationed the Levites in the temple of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and lyres in the way prescribed by David and Gad, the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet. This was commanded by the Lord through his prophets. Now notice why did David do it? Because he was told to do it by not one prophet, but two prophets. Nathan and Gad told David, or the Lord told David to do this via these two prophets. And this is what they were told to do. Can you go? So the Levites stood ready with David's instruments and the priests with their trumpets. Hezekiah gave the order to sacrifice the burnt offering on the altar. As the offering began, singing to the Lord began also, accompanied by trumpets and the instruments of David, king of Israel. The whole assembly bowed in worship while the singers sang and the trumpeters played. All this continued until the sacrifice of the burnt offering was completed. When the offerings were finished, the king and everyone present with him knelt down and worshipped. King Hezekiah and his officials ordered the Levites to praise the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. So they sang praises with gladness and bowed their heads and worshipped. Look at that last verse, verse 30. King Hezekiah ordered the Levitical choir to sing the psalms of David and of Asaph regularly as part of the daily service. Now David instituted the praise singing, but Hezekiah was responsible for the collection of psalms. Now, if you like, there were lots of hymns floating around, but Hezekiah compiled the first psalm book. And it grew from then onwards. We don't know when it was finally closed, probably in the post-exilic period, when they decided which psalms were in and which were out. They go back to David. But notice how three things occur together. As the burnt offering is offered on the altar, um, the Levitical choir sings the psalm of praise. They address the psalm of praise to the congregation out here. And the priests blow the trumpet to announce that the Lord is here, present. And at the end of every verse, what happens? What do the congregation do? They fall down and worship God, which means they prostrate themselves like Muslims in front of the altar. So those three things together. Sacrifice, praise and worship. Worship which is prostration. Those three things together. Any questions? Okay, well, what is the Psalter? 
The Psalter is the hymn book of the Second Temple. Hymn book is slightly misleading uh, because it's first and foremost a choir book. It was the choir anthem book. And if you look at it in Hebrew, you see that it not only has the words, but it also has little notations of up and below the words which give you the tunes that are to be sung. There's one problem, however, is that the secret to deciphering that notation has been lost. There have been some really brilliant attempts to crack the code, and some of the more recent ones are fairly convincing because they build on, they are based on ancient uh, uh, understanding of ancient music rather than modern music. Is that like Salah? Salah is what a musical uh, marker. Okay? Uh, but it doesn't give you the tune. But you get little notes above and below the Hebrew text which show you what the tune is. Um, so it is a hymn book. It's used by the choir, but then from the choir it was used by ordinary people, like a hymn book. You can use a hymn book in church, but you can also use a hymn book as your devotion book. And that's the use of the Psalms. Yes? How did the Jews have lost something like that? Did they stop praising God for a number of years or something? They've stopped praising God ever since the temple's been destroyed. destroyed. Uh, this could only happen in God's presence at the temple in Jerusalem. Notice this was, the choir was instituted for the temple. So temple and praise, presence of God, atonement, all belong together. Um, ever since the destruction of the temple, the Jews no longer uh, uh, use, sing the psalms by, uh, the, with full musical instruments. They chant the psalms. So you chant them rather than uh, sing them, if I can put that way. You know what chant is? Mm -hmm. And it's out of that you get Gregorian chant. Comes out of the synagogue. Now a lot of the tunes from uh, the temple were taken across into the synagogue, but they were simplified. The chant line was the only thing that was left, not the musical notation. Yeah. Um, so there's no musical instruments classically in the synagogue. You can only use musical instruments at the temple. Uh, why, do, why the temple? Because you praise God in His presence. And you praise God where you have access to His presence and access to His blessings, access to His grace. So they don't believe at all that God is present no matter where they are? Uh, only in a general sense, but not, not, in the, not in a specific sense. So the glory of God is not with them. Um, it does. It's it's okay. Now, um, what's the purpose of the Psalter? You can see it by the way the books are arranged. Let's read Psalm one, which gives you some clue as to um, one purpose of the Book of Psalms. Stephen, I think it's your turn. Yes, yeah, sir. Psalm one, and it has no title which indicates it's part of the heading of the whole book. It's an introductory psalm, and it tells you something about the whole Psalter. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the consent of the wicked, uh, counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates, meditates day and night. It is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. That, by the way, is our psalm for this week, in case you hadn't noticed. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, what is the mark of a righteous person according to this psalm? Stephen, what is a righteous person? What's the mark of a righteous person? Does not walk, walk in the counsel of the wicked. Wicked, so that's the negative mark. In the Lord. Of the, and what does he do because he, he delights? He meditates. meditates. 
Mal now, the word for meditate, hagar, is to mull over, to speak it to yourself, to uh, uh, focus on it by speaking it to yourself. So, um, a righteous person is one who meditates on the law, the teaching of the Lord, day and night, and that makes him a fruitful person, uh, like a fruit tree planted by a water canal, whereas the wicked person is like chaff that the wind blows away. Notice the contrasting pictures. Well, why has this psalm been composed and placed here at the head of the Psalter? Well, it, it shows us what the book of Psalms is meant to be used for. Meditation. meditation. It arises out of meditation on God's Word. And what does it tell you, teach you to do? How to meditate on God's Word. On God's word. Now, uh, for many years, I've been teaching Christian spirituality, and part of the un Christian spirituality is teaching meditation. And uh, I don't know how many times people have asked me, what's the best book on meditation? I have no hesitation in telling them Psalms. Now, what's different about Psalms and other books of meditation? Other books of meditation tell you what you have to do and how to do it, but the Psalms actually give you meditations. So they don't tell you how to do it or what to do, but they actually do it for you. Do you realize that for the first thousand years of the history of the church to meditate was basically to say the Psalms to yourself? So Psalms teach meditation on the Word of God. Um, the second thing, the second purpose of the Psalter is shown by Psalm 2, and it's not quite so obvious. This is a royal psalm. Imagine that this psalm would have been used at the coronation of Solomon and his successors as king. And remember too that the Psalter was compiled in the post-exilic period where there was no king in Israel. Okay, Tony, can you read Psalm 2? Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Just stop there. Anointed one in Hebrew is Messiah, in Greek is Christ. So the Lord and his Messiah, the Lord and his Christ. Keep going. Let us break their chains, they say and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned, enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have restored my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you be destroyed in your way, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Okay, there's a lot here, but I don't have time to look at it. But I'd just like you to focus on that last verse. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Who is the him here, Stephen? Serve the Lord, kiss the sun. Well, God knows for sure. Hmm? Who is, take refuge in who? Is it the Messiah? It is in the Messiah. Oh. It's the Son. Now, there's something funny here because for, uh, this is most unexpected because normally you take refuge in the book of Psalms, in God. But here, you the, uh, this psalm encourages people to take refuge in the Messiah. the Messiah. Now, for Jews, originally the, the Messiah was a human being, David and his successors. Uh, to take refuge in the Messiah. Now, what's, what's funny about this being placed at the head of the Psalms, Book of Psalms, in the post-exilic period? There is 
king. There is no king. So how can they take refuge in? The king, the Messiah. So how would they have understood it? Why would they have placed it here? No king, and yet they're supposed to take refuge in the king. Because they yeah? had a future hope of this. They had a future. So they were to take refuge in not the Messiah who had come or who was present, but the Messiah who would come in the future. So it teaches the Jews to look forward and to hope for and to take refuge in the coming Messiah who would fulfill this psalm. This psalm would be fulfilled when the Messiah comes. Now, how do we as Christians read this psalm? Jesus. Jesus, who is, has come. So we take refuge in Jesus. So um, uh, all the psalms are in some way connected with David. They are royal. They have to do with kingship. Um, the, uh, the, so the second purpose of the book of Psalms is to teach people to hope in God's Messiah and to take refuge in him, to look to the Messiah for help and uh, our salvation. Lastly, the whole book of Psalms ends with uh, Hallelujah Psalms. The Hallelujah Psalms begin at the end of Psalm 104. And then you get more and more Hallelujah Psalms. So read the last book of the Psalms and notice how many Hallelujah Psalms there are. And then it ends with a whole series of Hallelujah Psalms, 145 to 50. Now, that shows us the purpose of the Psalter. The third purpose of the Psalter is to teach the church to do what? To praise God, not just in worship, but also in the whole of life and as an anticipation of heaven. So they are to join in praising God together with the angels here on earth because what will they do? What was, will they do forever in the age to come when the Messiah comes? They will praise God. A wonderful, wonderful book. Um, I hope that you get the privilege of doing further work on the Psalms sometime in your life. Next book, Proverbs. Now, whereas the book of Psalms um, focuses on worship and the role of praise in worship, its context, its situation is the temple in Jerusalem, we move them when we come to Proverbs to the classroom. Right? So this is educational material. This is how they learn to write. And it has to do with, if you like, the primary school curriculum in ancient Israel. But it is not a secular curriculum. It is a religious curriculum. Um, now, and, and it's totally different to the, what we learn in school. But you have to put it in that school setting. And I'd like to um, uh, imagine, get you to uh, uh, put you in the situation, say if I was a teacher in the school that Solomon established in Jerusalem to train people to help him administer his kingdom. Okay? So you are young men and women, you're going to work for Solomon, you're going to be a civil servant for Solomon, a, bu a, a, a bureaucrat, and to do that you have to learn to read and write and think. Read, write, think. Okay? Um, so that you can help him administer his kingdom. So this is primary school stuff. So you're, yeah, I'm, I'm your teacher. Now, uh, the first thing you have to do is to learn to read. You've got that in your pad. Okay, now we have and, and what I'd do is I'd have a blackboard like this and you'd have a slate, you wouldn't have any paper, there'd be no computer. All you'd have is a blackboard and a slate, okay? And you'd have a piece of chalk. I'd have a blackboard here, not a, uh, a whiteboard with a pen, and I would write this out. And as I did it, you would, I'd say, follow me, and I'd do letter by letter. Hebrew here, I'd start off writing, and then you'd write the letter. You'd notice how I formed the letter, and then you'd do it. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I'd read this sentence out aloud, phonetically, get you to read it, and then I would write, uh, I'd write it out, then I'd read it to you, um, and then I'd get you to write it out, say, ten times, just to practice writing, until you came to the bottom of your slate. 
And then I'd get up your slate and I'd say, uh-huh, yeah, okay, uh, uh, Garth, uh, you missed out a word there, or you missed out a letter. Uh, or failure, you better do it all again, or you better stay in for morning tea. Oh, that's Okay, now. Now, okay, and, and the proverb that I'd, I want to show you three different kinds of proverbs. Now, the point of the proverb is to teach you, first of all, to read, and then to write, and then to think. And it's different to our curriculum because the focus is not on content of thinking but on how to think, not what to think. Okay, here I get a proverb. As iron sharpens iron, so a person sharpens the face of his neighbour. Okay, to open it up, what does this proverb have to say? What does this proverb mean? Stephen, let us start off with you. What's the basic picture in this proverb? Well, you can't have, uh, well, I suppose iron sharpens iron. Okay, just, just explain that to me. Have you ever seen that happening? Um, Your father is a farmer, isn't he? Sheary, yeah. Yeah, she oh, well, we, yes, we, but you have, in the ancient world, you have, uh, uh, you know, shears like that. Uh, uh, what's the shears made of? Yes. Iron. Iron, iron. iron. Well, why made of iron? Why not of bronze, which is cheaper? Iron doesn't lose the sharpness. Okay, now uh, let's take, you know, uh, uh, can you explain these other guys, you know, they're not sheep farmers, they haven't come from a sheep farm. What, what does a uh, 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 sheep shears look like? Oh, well, it's a comb, so you got the handpiece and then you... No, 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 you're, you're thinking in modern terms, in ancient terms. Oh, it's, a shears. it's like a big scissors, isn't it? It's like a big pair of scissors, yeah. It's like a big <laughs> pair of scissors, okay? And it's made of iron, and what happens? You get two blades that... Each other. Okay, now what happens? Now, there's two different kinds of sheep shears. There's the ones that are badly made, and if you misalign them, then what's going to happen? Cut They'll cut in each other, and they will do what? Damage. Blunt. But if you do it too much the other way, it's too loose, then? Won't cut the wool. Won't cut the wool. But what happens? Your father's really good shearer, and he's got your, your ace kind of shears. What do they do? Well, it, A, the wool slides off and they keep each other sharp as they go. Right, now you get funny thing, you get one iron blade sharpening its opposite. Well, as you cut it. As you cut it. You don't it's, it like a You don't, if, you, if it's, it's like a, it's, it's like a self-sharpening scissors. Have you got a self-sharpening scissors? You can get really A scissors that you never have to sharpen because every time you cut something, the blade is so finely calibrated that it sharpens, it not only cuts, but it sharpens the opposite edge. Now, uh, uh, iron in the ancient world was the hardest metal, the hardest substance that you had. So it's, what's the only way of sharpening iron? Use iron. We use iron to wet the blade. You are sharpen iron against iron. That's the picture. Okay, you've all seen it, but you know it from direct experience of your dad. Okay, okay, that's the picture. What does this picture mean? As iron sharpens iron, you get the basic picture? Either wetting on it, like a whetstone, steel that you use to sharpen kitchen knives, steel. You still have steel, hard edge. Okay, so a person sharpens the face of his neighbour or his friend. What's that getting at, David? Um, people influencing each other, making each other, I don't know, sharpening. Sharpening. Okay, good. What kind of people sharpen what kind of people? And what and sharpen in what way? Um, um, kind of people. Yeah. Uh, well, Think in terms of the picture. Like-minded people? Oh, is it like-minded? No, it's... Thing the same thing. Like, you do the same. Opposite of Op- Opposite. You can notice that you get two opposites sharpening each other. Why the face there? What's the unexpected word here? I'd expect it as iron sharpens iron, so a person sharpens his neighbour. Neighbor. But what's meant by face? Stephen, why face? Nice. When does sharpening occur? How do people sharpen each other? Yeah. In, what kind of interaction? Good, yes. Yeah. What kind of interaction? 
What am I doing? Getting in your face. But a face-to-face interaction. And what kind of face-to-face interaction? It's opposite. But it can be good, it can be bad. Confrontation it can be. Sharpen in what way? What's sharpening? What's the sharpening that's going on where you get two people as they work together and do what? As they cooperate or not cooperate or... Yeah. And where does the most sharpening occur? Not cooperation. Well, cooperation, okay, you can you just ignore each other. Okay. And you're butting heads. You're butting heads. Is there a person who agrees with you? No, it's when they uh, disagree, because then you've got to understand what you believe, and you can... Okay, disagree. if a person... So the, 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 the best person to teach you to think is not your... Uh, the person agrees with you, but your critic, because what does your critic force you to do? Think it challenges you in your thinking. So what, what's the result of that where you get a person who criticizes you, raises question you, confronts you? What's sharpened there? Your beliefs. Your, your thinking is sharpened. So you get one kind of sharpening is thinking sharpening. Is there other kinds of sharpening besides sharpening your mind? Who's the pers- which person has sharpened you most as a human being? Hmm? Yeah, I'm going to stick with that one. I'm not going to ask you. I was going to say James. James, why? Because I live with him. <laughs> what? Because I have to learn to live with him. Because you have to learn to with him. Is he the same as you? No. Why do, and how, are you, how do you both sharpen each other? By butting heads. By butting heads. And what is sharpened? Is it just your way of thinking? That's all occurs. But what else is, what other kind of sharpening has occurred in your marriage? And anybody here in marriage? marriage. What? <laughs> Not in your marriage. You've married guys. Okay. Here. Here. You, you, you've been at it for quite a while. Or <laughs> well, she's been at you for quite a while. Yeah, well, that's uh, butting heads, nag to death, you know. Sometimes it uh, hits home. Okay, but that's the process. But what's the sharpening that occurs? The trust, the, the, the trust, the heart stuff. The heart stuff. What's being sharpened there? Not your mind, but your... Your character. Your character, your heart, your feelings. I was going to say, could you say spirit? Your spirit, everything. Personality. Your personality. Uh, you knock the rough corners off each other. You, your feelings are sharpened. You learn to feel not just for yourself, but you learn to understand the way the other person feels. You, don't, you learn to understand the way the other person thinks. And uh, the biggest sharpening that occurs is the sharpening of character because you have to learn, you know, you get a man and a woman together, it's, um, it's opposite, it shouldn't work. But why has God put opposites together? To sharpen each other. Okay, now, um, can you see... Now, what I've been doing is tried to put myself in the shoes of an ancient teacher. Have I told you what the interpretation of this proverb is? Is there one interpretation of this proverb, Stephen? Um, There's probably more than one. There are thousands of possible... Oh, no. (laughs) It depends on what? The teacher. The situation. In different situations, you use the proverb in different ways. So, a proverb doesn't teach you what to think, but what does a proverb do? Now, now, just reflect on what we were doing here. Discussing. Discuss, good. Thinking. What? We were doing You were sharpening, I was sharpening, we were sharpening each other's way of thinking. What else is happening? What were you called on? Were you just examining this? You were using this to, what, what did you bring this in connection with? Not just your minds, but your experience. And we started off with what's known. What's the known thing that I started off with? How iron sharpens iron. Now, we're not familiar with it anymore, but anybody in the ancient world would know that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Not you, Tony. You're just ancient. You're not the ancient world. Uh, so what you do is to start off with the un- unknown, and you, instead of starting off out there where, where, where you t- tell people what they are supposed to know, you start off with what they do know. And you start off with the unknown, with the known, and you use that to explore what? The unknown. the unknown. And what unknown? Is it unknown out there? 
but you use it to explore your own experience. And so wisdom has to do not with knowledge, abstract knowledge, but it has to do with the knowledge that comes from experience, practical experience of relationships. What was I drawing on when I uh, was doing this here? What was I drawing on with you? As what? In which area? As, as a wife. What was I drawing on your experience? Who else was it here? Um, who was the one about sharpening thinking? Yeah, it was you. Or who was it? Who was it? Then your experience of criticism. Me. And uh, uh, Levi, okay? <laughs> right, now do you see, do you get some inkling of the way it works? And you can uh, imagine then what happens then at the end of the lesson? Is that the, uh, uh, is, is that the end of the lesson? We go outside and we'll talk about it and we go, oh, Gus, what did you reckon? What did you reckon? And even if you don't talk about it, you say, uh, because you're mulling over it and you've mem by the time you've written that out 20 times, what's... You've memorised. You've memorised it. And, and, and it's in Hebrew, it's a little poem, it's a little haiku, it's, it's easy to memorise. Now, after I've said one of these to myself or written it out, say, five times, I've memorised it. So you've memorised it, and it's there to help you to think your way through and to make sense of what? Life. Life. Right, so it's wisdom, it teaches you, it gives you a tool, it doesn't give you the explanation of life, the theory of life, but what does it do? It gives you some help in making sense of what is senseless. Because there's a bit of a paradox here, if you think in terms of thinking, which people should you expect to learn the most from? Like yeah, like-minded people. But which, in fact, are the people that are most significant in your mental sharpening? Opposite-minded opposite -minded. people who challenge you, people who contradict you. They are the ones who teach you to think and sharpen your mind. Um, right? Iron sharpens iron, so what happens? So a person sharpens the face of his neighbour. That only happens how? If you interact face to face with each other. So it says something about the importance of face to face interactions. Don't, now you could take it from any level from mental thinking, emotional sharpening, you could have it character sharpening, but it also has to do with spiritual sharpening. What kind of people sharpen us spiritually? The people. Yeah. It is that, yeah. You could, we very often learn most from, not yeah. from believers, but from unbelievers. Well, well, we're acting evenly. Yes, I do. all sorts of things. But even, even if it's not negative, you learn things spiritually. You are sh your spirit is sharpened, how? By sitting by yourself in isolation? No. It's face-to-face -face interaction. So, um, if I can bring it quite home here, why is it that we don't conduct our seminary curriculum via the internet? Well, not can you see? Can yeah. yeah. Uh, Let's assume everybody could use the internet. Because you can't have the same face-to-face. -face. Okay. The most important learning is not out of books, not on a computer screen. The most important learning that you will make this year is... Face-to-face. -face. Human contact. Face-to-face. -face. Emotional. It's where there's the whole person involved. Emotional. Yes. So it's the face-to-face -face, um, that results in the getting of wisdom. Lastly, okay, the book is about the getting of wisdom. What's the basic difference between wisdom and knowledge? Yep. Knowledge is like facts and stuff. Yes. Wisdom is how to apply those. Facts, okay. Uh, is, this, uh, is, is wisdom the same thing as intelligence? No. no, because where would you expect to find the wisest people? Would you expect to find them in the universities? Maybe. We would expect In our society, we do. But, you know, I've experienced, and I've had a lot to do with universities, the biggest fools that I know are 
The, the uh, intellectuals. And do you know where I've found the, do you know where I've found some of the wisest people that I know? You find them on farms. Farms, park workers, park benches, all over the place. Most unexpected I think of a fisherman I know, or many farmers that I know, or are ordinary people. Now what's the basic classroom for the getting of wisdom? Okay, you know where it uh, knowledge, you go down to you, you know, primary school, secondary school, but uni is the real place to get knowledge. Where is the classroom for wisdom? The what? The home, the, the home and the world. It's what uh, Australians call the University of Hard Knocks. The school of life teaches wisdom, and only experience teaches wisdom. So, uh, for the book of Proverbs, uh, what's the basic credential for a wise person? Um, for a, uh, a doctor, uh, the basic credential is, you know, the hat and the gown. What's the basic credential for the Old Testament? The mark of a person who is wise? White hair. Oh. White hair. So I'm a wise person. Okay, let's continue at the next period. Yep.